Welcome to this new episode of the Life Itself podcast. I have the privilege today of being joined by Professor uh, Joe Henrich. He is the Ruth Moore Professor of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University, and he is the author of several books, most recently two widely read popular books, The Weirdest People in the World and The Secret of Our Success. He has had a unique career in many ways because his trajectory has taken him across as actually being a tenured professor across multiple disciplines in anthropology, in economics, in psychology and human evolutionary biology. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to have you on the show, Joe. Thank you so much for joining us. And I wonder if we could just start by you telling us a little bit about that unique career directory. Like what, what got you interested in this what what motivated you and, and what was your kind of path a little bit yeah so uh first it's good to be with you um but i i got started so when i was an undergraduate at the university of notre dame i went to study aerospace engineering uh and in my first year i took a course in anthropology and i was interested in it but i wasn't ready to give up the engineering so i was fortunate that notre dame had a, a dual degree uh, program where you could get a degree in arts uh, in uh, arts and sciences or arts and letters, and then a degree in engineering. So I have a BA and a BS uh, undergraduate degree. It took five years, but that allowed me to study both anthropology and engineering. I went and did engineering for a few years, uh, working at an undisclosed location in Northern Virginia. And while I was doing that, I was thinking, well, do I want to continue on this path and maybe consider graduate school? I wanted to study space propulsion or uh, you know, explore anthropology more and go into that. And so after two years of, of doing engineering, I quit and moved to California and enrolled in anthropology program at UCLA. Uh, and then you know, I, I wanted to do a science of culture, a science of anthropology. And the, the professor that I had started working with was he had done that too, although it wasn't very fashionable at the time. And um, as I was working there, I began reading more widely and bringing in tools from other disciplines and just kind of pursuing that. And then I found another professor at uh, UCLA called Robert Boyd. And Boyd had kind of been working, you know, he hadn't had students and he was working very much alone, uh, building mathematical models of cultural evolution. So I got really interested in that uh, and really went from there, trying to trying to build an empirical program around some of the mathematical models that Boyd and his collaborator, Pete Richardson, had built. Well, can I say, well, then come to other things. So this is fascinating. I mean, just, just an aside for me, uh, and I, I'm going to interject, like I, when I got in, I was an economist for a while, and I was interested in the kind of evolution of knowledge and knowledge kind of production in a more formal economic sense. But then I, I, I'd also come from a mathematical background. I'd studied math uh, originally. And I got into like branching processes and stuff like that. Um, so I just kind of like take me back to that part, which is like you said, he was kind of had no students. Like, why was this? This was kind of rare in anthropology, right? At the time. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, I mean, I, this is all public knowledge, I think. Um, uh, UCLA wanted to hire Rob's wife, whose name is Joan Silk, and she's now a renowned primatologist. So it was a very smart hire, but he was a spousal hire that was kind of trailing along. Um, he doesn't have a degree in anthropology. He has a PhD in ecology and an undergraduate in physics. And so he gets hired as the spousal hire and he's just building these mathematical models, which seems very odd and foreign to the, to all anthropologists, including the people at UCLA. He did work with one guy named Bob Unger, but he wasn't technically his advisor. So I was really his first you know, advisee type student. But then for whatever reason, two years after I kind of showed up on the scene, he brought in two other uh, new students. And then we very quickly began working together. And um, Richard McElrath, who was my friend from graduate school, is now director of one of the Max Planck Institutes. Yeah. Well, and I also guess what I'm asking also is in anthropology, it that wasn't common. Like it, it, that, that was a, that, that approach, which is, I guess, mathematical. And as you said, building models of kind of cultural evolution and phylogeny i.e what is the the kind of tree of of culture what and and that that's i guess what i what i also kind of lead into is this trajectory that you've then gone on it there has been sort of an explosion in a way out of in this on this area and what's driving that and what is this kind of what's of what's kind of cooking what's evolving because obviously what i would say is that very interesting moments happen obviously in 
if we kind of we can kind of almost be a bit meta here like in the evolution of disciplines just as like cognitive science which is now a kind of a major discipline and which has all these connections it's partly under psychology but it brings other stuff there are these very fruitful moments when different disciplines come together and something kind of significant new emerges do you feel that kind of thing is ha has been happening over the like the space of your career in the area you're in yeah. So certainly over the last two decades or a bit longer, <clears throat> there's been an explosion of the field that we now call cultural evolution, although it didn't have that name until about 2010. And uh, that has brought together psychologists, uh, linguists, economists, anthropologists, and, and others from scattered from around the social sciences. And, you know, now there's a, a society um, and a lot of interest, I think, and a, and a lot of publications and see general science journals like Nature Human Behavior. Now, this traces back to work that really began in the late 1970s, uh, where first Cavalli Sforza and Mark Feldman got together, and they wrote a book called um, Cultural Transmission and Evolution, published in 1981. And meanwhile, Boyd and Richardson were also began working. They published their first paper on this in 1976, around the same time that Richard Dawkins is, begins to put the, the selfish meme idea out there. So there's some kind of interest going on. You know, there are culture wars are going on because there are sociobiologists who are trying to explain human behavior with evolution. And then there's people going, oh, but what about culture? You know, humans are cultural. And what these guys are doing is they're trying to think very systematically about culture and you know build models of it but then also say this has to flow within some kind of evolutionary model so boyd and richardson really distill all this in their 1985 book where they assume we're products of natural selection we're animals but we're animals who rely heavily on learning from other people and that we have specialized mechanisms in our heads that allow us to from a young age learn language and social norms and how to use tools and all those kinds of things that we think of as culture so it seats culture within a broader evolutionary framework and then allows us to think systematically about where do ethnic groups come from? Well, let's start with humans as learners and, and why would you why would ethnic groups ever pop up? And you can ask questions at the sociological level. And I guess one question I'm also asking that just to go back, which is, you know, anthropology had. I mean, anthropology is a young discipline. I, mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to now make myself foolish, but you know, we're talking a hundred years. Obviously, there's folk and there's much stuff older than that, but we're talking a hundred, a bit over a hundred years. But why, like, like there's kind of the subdiscipline again. I'm, you know, I'm not an anthropologist, but there's cultural anthropology. But this was kind of like that. This hadn't been such. It would be much more qualitative, right? There's something kind of there's mathematical models. There's then a tendency to want to go test this. You're describing certain things that have been coming up. Part of that might be you're saying it's just genetics and got more rigorous and got and was kind of getting more, in, you know, the selfish gene. The very fact that we had a rich genetics was inspiring the idea of memetics. But what was it? Is it also there's been a revolution in data? Because that's one of the things you were doing was then going out and starting to empirically, like, you know, for me, uh, I was like, you were trying to empirically look at things. And for me, like one, at least from reading your books, was just this kind of idea of like, oh, you were kind of going through economics to like the ultimatum game, you know, are there replicable standardized kind of things that would give me kind of cross-cultural data that isn't just like, we've got a lot of data. I think it's in the Yale database. We've got a lot of data on like marriage practices, but it's not kind of, it's not able to be kind of like standardized in a way that's going to allow us to make as good cross-cultural analysis. You know, right. I guess I'm trying to ask also, what was it that led to the empirical revolution or allowed these, these kind of folk ideas become, more rigorous because also yeah um, so and i mean the one key thing so i started to talk about what i began doing in the 90s but that was uh i was running directly upstream against what was going on in anthropology because anthropology had, was becoming less rigorous and less quantitative and less interested in that kind of stuff it, the history is complex in anthropology but you know, beginning with Franz Boas, who's considered the founder of American anthropology, there was a rich effort to go out into the world and just record, figure out what people are doing, um, do a lot of in-depth ethnography, counting and quantifying was okay, but really you wanted to do a lot of ethnography. 
the group at Yale with the human relations area files, James yes. Peter Murdoch began, you know, at least quantifying things at the societal level. So we could compare different societies yes. and look at different patterns of kinship or language or all these kind of cool things. So th it was quantitative and it, it stays quantitative up until the 1970s. And then, you know, Anthropology begins with a with a spread of postmodernism, French structuralism. It begins completely rejecting anything quantitative, and really, I, I kind of unwittingly and stupidly, I show up, and my advisors are older, right? They're of the pre-generation. They're of the generation that was still quantitative, and so, you know, my my advisor, my first advisor not Rob Boyd, a guy named Alan Johnson, had written a book in the 70s called Quantification and Anthropology, which started to talk about how we could use computers and how we can do systematic data collection. Uh, but he was really an old dog. And he, you know, the trend in the field was going directly away from him. But I, you know, I had an enterprise that I wanted to do. And uh, you know, Boyd and Richardson had all this theory. So I just started picking out tools from other disciplines. So in addition to harvesting things from uh, behavioral economics, like the ultimatum game, I was also, you know, working with Richard Nesbitt, for example, and taking tools from psychology, trying to measure yep. psychological variation around the world. And I was, you know, I didn't know she was going to win a Nobel Prize, but I was reading Eleanor Ostrom just because, you know, she was doing interesting work on cooperation and I was learning about public goods games. Yeah, okay. So, so in a way that so one interesting thing is this these kind of like in a way even a cultural tide within the discipline influence stuff and there's kind of been a, a chain uh, whether it's in anthropology but this is kind of coming together um so maybe just kind of step let's step that forward is that there's this emerging what i guess in the background here there's an emerging discipline you're calling it cultural evolution um i like to joke sometimes you know what happened to culturology you know in a way, what what happened to the science of the study of culture? I mean, I know it, it's not in any discipline, but we want that seems just central to humanity. And what what kind of um, so if we kind of looked into that in your in your then evolution, what you see that happening the the study of cultural evolution. What are some of the building blocks? I mean, first of all, maybe just for myself, and it's such an obvious thing. But what do we mean by culture here? I know this is a kind of chestnut, but just roughly. What are we talking about when we say we're studying culture for people? Yeah, so the the core idea is that uh, people learn stuff, right? So culture is information that got in our heads through some kind of learning process, usually a social learning process. And what we're doing when we're building a model of cultural evolution is we're tracking that information in individual minds through time. The, the evolution, the sort of natural selection genetic side of it comes into it because we once we say, well, okay, that's probably an important thing in humans, we can say, well, how might natural selection have shaped us to make us good cultural learners? Right. What kinds of things should we pay attention to? How should we immigrate, integrate information from different people uh, in an effective, adaptive way that allows an individual to better navigate the world? But then once you have a group of individuals, a population doing that, then you get these population level phenomena. So one of the things, you know, economics has got interested in institutions in the last 25 years, but that's really, they came kind of down to that, right? They were trying to solve higher level questions. Cultural evolution had to cobble up to figure out what an institution is. Okay, people learn stuff, then we get social norms. And what's an institution? Well, an institution is a collection of social norms that regulate a certain area like marriage. And then when we put laws on top of that, that's typically what economists think of as institutions when you have kind of legally it's regulated formal. rules for interacting. Yes. Okay. And so, so first of all, so to kind of, um, and what I also want to mark in there is therefore what you're also mentioning is that across different disciplines, cult, this thing of the culture, we're kind of um, convert that there's a convergence from several directions. Economists are maybe converging down towards that um, because it's kind of the base layer culture um, I mean, even below it, and, and we're going to talk about that, is kind of, you might say, I would call it ontology, maybe we just call it psychology to not have a fancy term, but what gives our views and values and way of being in the world? Who do we conceive ourselves to be? Strictly that psychology, but it also is a bit richer. But there's these kind of layers down, there's kind of like, there's the formal institutions, there's kind of the informal, there's there's then the psychology. And culture's near the bottom of that. As you, I think you've got quite a broad definition, which is, strictly like it's hard to determine where in culture informal institutions and formal institutions separate because some of the people debate about that you know is it, is it culture is it institutions or is it 
you know, genet genetic, you know, um, kind of inbuilt psychology. And the other direction is kind of building up in what you're saying is that we've been able to get better and better tools in kind of, um, I don't want to call it scientific anthropology or science, you know, where we can go upwards of people's beliefs into aggregating that and how that forms institutions. Yeah. So there, there's a few other trends going on at this time, which I think are interesting. So um, within psychology, there's this older field of cross-cultural psychology where they had been doing um, kind of using psychological tools in different societies. But for reasons I don't totally understand, it remained relegated to the peripheries of psychology through most of its history. Uh, then in 1991, um, Hazel Marcus and uh, Shinobu Kitayama publish a paper <clears throat> in a lead psychology journal, which really sparks up this field called um, cultural psychology. And then Dick Nesbitt gets in the act and studies the culture of honor. And then the field of um, cultural psychology really begins to take off. And they don't really know what they're doing with culture and they don't have a very good theory of culture, but they do know that they're finding psychological differences among populations. That, that previously the field would have said that we, they, these weren't expected. Uh, and then in economics, uh, Rob Boyd, my, my advisor who I was telling you about, <coughs> he's in this MacArthur group with Sam Boyd, Colin Kammer, Ernst Fair, and a lot of behavioral economists. And then we begin doing experiments across different societies. And that gets economics, at least a corner of economics, more interested in culture and stuff. And there seems to be a recognition that in order to address the, the rise of the West question and why are some countries are rich and some countries are poor, maybe at least legal origins might matter. And once you have legal origins, then why do different countries have different legal origins? And then you begin to you pull the thread, right? Yeah, you pull the thread. I mean, listen, I mean, this is, for me, going back, uh, I mentioned I'm, I'm a Zen Buddhist and, um, you know, so I, I got interested in because I was interested in happiness research, but also I was a Buddhist and, you know, you open any econ textbook and like the beginning is, you know, economics is about the allocation of scarce resources among, you know, with unlimited wants. This is, you know, I literally opened a textbook of a, my 15 year old kind of knee nephew the other day, and this is it. And I was seeing there as a Buddhist saying, okay, but um, at least in happiness, crude Buddhism, I'm going to simplify it, but you know, it's like, preferences are are, are changeable mm. you know you, you your suffering arises because you've got not because you just got preferences but you've got cravings you can transform craving and that's the path to true liberation you know can you imagine it's kind of like the the inverse like you should spend all your attention as a human being on like basically transforming your inner self rather than trying to acquire things right. which is kind of economics externally to satisfy them um yeah. and what's funny is you go into economic literature at this point when i was in the mid 2000s uh, when I was doing this, and you're like, the, there are these models called endogenous preferences, which in economics, is, you'll know, is fancy terminology for like your preferences can change within mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. And they kind of die out in the 70s, traditionally, um, because they're too complicated, basically, which is unfortunately, right. like in macro stuff, they lead to like weird equilibria and so on. And they only get resurrected, actually, by rational addiction. Like the Chicago school use a bunch of them in like the 90s and 2000s for rational addiction models of smoking. You know, um, but it's like it, it's in a weird way. This is one of these things which would be almost existential, the core of economics, because once you think culture is significant, you're like, well, what creates culture? What creates being? Right. You know, and you have some of this in Mullen Nathan, who's your co uh, will be a colleague. But, you know, there is this stuff on like um, bounded rationality and self-control. You know, like I only have so much, this is big in psychology, you know, like ego mode, ma management, you know, I only have so much self-control. What do I spend it on? But that goes deep. Like, should I spend my, my limited self-control on like working hard to acquire stuff or work hard meditating, for example, right? You know, if you right. really ran this, um, you, you'd be in a very interesting place of like where, what, you know, how, what shapes being and how should we, we, you know, do that? Yeah. Yeah, no. So I, I've had this discussion uh, frequently with economists over the years, and the answers have changed, which is, I think, a good thing from my point of view. So, uh, a, I mean, a good example is Sam Bowles wrote a paper around 1997, which is, the, it's got endogenous preferences in the title. And it's basically making the case using lots of different evidence from before that, that humans have endogenous preferences. It's a great paper, but it doesn't go anywhere, right? It, or at least, I mean, eventually it turns out to have a big impact, but it wasn't like everybody, it was on everybody's lips or anything. It didn't have a big immediate impact. Uh, I think for the reasons you're suggesting, it was a very slow takeoff. 
people like Nathan Nunn had to get into the in, and he had to get the development people in there and the economic history people. But whenever I've brought this up, and I'm so I would say start say things obnoxious to economists like we know people acquire preferences via cultural learning. I can give you a big piles of evidence to show. So we know preferences are exogenous. Why are you or sorry endogenous? Why are you assuming they're exogenous? And yes. it was basically the kind of mathematical argument you said: if if preferences can move around, there's too many parts yes. moving, and we can't. <laughs> so we're just going to assume this is fixed, and then, yeah. that can't be the right answer. <laughs> that that can't be the right answer, and, and and it's sort of kind of profound here. And I mean, I'll give you other practical examples that really touch for me. So let's say, um, you know, let's say you're interested in education policy. And this is one of my favorite examples, okay? So people, we won't go, generally people talk about Finland as one example. Uh, we, we won't get to the debate right now about how well Finland, but certainly for example, when the first set of um, cross, uh, cross country assessment came out, which was the OECD PISA stuff. And it came out also when people didn't know it was a test, which was really important because once you have a test for a really small period of time, it becomes rubbish unfortunately, because people teach to it. Finland like aced this, you know, it came top or close to the top. And you're asked then a question about, well, how can you reproduce the Finnish education system? And a lot of our world today will go like, oh, they have their schools laid out like this, or they have a curriculum like that. But then you'd say, well, it's actually the culture. For example, if you go and uh, read books, you interview people, they're like, well, you know, we have really high trust of our teachers. So we let them teach you know, we, we have very high trust so they can teach. Also, pupils tend to respect them. Or we have a society where being a, a primary school teacher is the number one desired profession as a woman. Right. You know, and, and, all, and yet then huge amounts of ink will get, which is kind of, I would say, is a cultural type explanation. Now, of course, you can influence that by structuring, you know, paying teachers more. But again, they don't actually pay teachers that much more. But right. it's highly it's higher status. With this it's community. high prestige. Yes. And that's another point. I've actually got a quote. I've got it in my excerpt in your book. And we should come to that. I think at one point where you say, prestige is a universal amongst cultures. But what is kind of given prestige? What gives you to acquire prestige, whether it's growing big yams, I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase your quote, whether it's growing big yams or being great is incredibly variable. And given the centrality of that to what we do in the world, um, like, is it high prestige? to like consume lots of stuff and be really famous or is it high prestige to be a really brilliant scientist or is it high prestige to look after the environment you know we can kind of just see obviously in front of our eyes the profound impacts those things are going to have right. on the, our society and very major challenges we face uh, from the climate crisis to you know education to inequality to you name it um so this kind of going back on that endogenous preferences the point for listeners is there's a revolution happening people uh in a in, in a positive way which is if i would say economics is the dominant discipline of our age for for good or ill um it, you know what i meant is it reflects the kind of um at least from policymakers or the elite often a way of thinking about the world and the dominant kind of um social policy tool whether it's abused and i you know having been an economist who's given advice to government um you know I'm not, I'm not blaming, you know, economists for all that happened, but there's a really big revolution that you're describing is happening potentially. And that even is bubbling up in things like economics, where mm -hmm. this primacy of culture and the primacy of being the amount of evidence that's there is really becoming massive. And that that yeah. could have some profound impacts is what you're, yeah. you're saying. And, and I mean, I, I think we should, uh, I mean, economics deserves a hat tip in the sense yes. that I really think in the last 15 years, it's, the field's been very responsive. Um, and there's, you know, I see lots of young economists taking these questions on and, you know, uh, thinking thoughts they wouldn't have done so in the 90s. I, I really want to acknowledge that. I think one of the great strengths is quite empirically, the heavy empirical orientation is fantastic. I think the point I would just flag to you is that going to this point about endogenous preferences, while it is described as a technical barrier, just to go back to like, what would a Buddhist economics look like? Mm -hmm. There's something kind of baked in, you know, if you go back to Pareto, you know, um, who weirdly I read about in a sociological, there's a great, you know, survey by Raymond Aron of sociologists like Durkheim and Pareto's in there. It, there's, there's something quite deep in the economic way of seeing the world that, that goes back even to kind of early modernity that's under threat if you take this model seriously. If you take culture and ontology mm -hmm. really and psychology really seriously, 
I'll just take one other example here that comes from Buddhism. Not only is there, but my preferences are not fixed, but it also tells me that knowing what I really want is hard. Right. And therefore, we live in a society today, I'll just point out, where basically the two things that underpin our most good, summum bonum, which is con consumption in the free market and voting and democracy, are both based on, on the assumption that people know what they want. Now, of course, economists are kind of knocking the door. You know, Fishing for Fools is written by two Nobel Prize winners. Um, there is, but the, the, the challenge has always been that really calls into question some profound things about Western society if you keep running with it. Just as I would, in an analogy with your book, we could come to Protestantism called into question profound true kind of norms about the nature of the pre-modern world. Hmm. I, where did authority come from? How did you decide about things? Um, you know, sola scriptura, individualism, which as you point out, had come from a long history and will come to. But I just point out that, yeah, I think as a scientific discipline, but that that's something really, that's kind of a seismic shift in society as we start to take your and other work seriously. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I mean, uh, the, the, just as a practical level, as someone who, you know, sometimes finds himself advising young PhD students in, in economics is it's still the case that everybody wants a utility function and that they really want to, you know, they might have an interesting empirical result, but they've got to figure out how to get that result from, uh, you know, a utility function that they have to use to get the result. So, and in the sense that individuals as optimizers, you got to be optimizing something and, you know, sometimes in our models of cultural evolution, we think people are very much choosing unconsciously and they're not weighing costs and benefits in the way suggested by, by the standard model. Yes. So I wanted to, so build on that, this kind of primacy of, of being thesis, like kind of coming from this, this emergence of a new discipline of cultural evolution, but also maybe a discipline that's put, that's, you know, anthropology. Apology, as we put it in my sense when i went to university was i don't know it wasn't it was a bit of a site like it wasn't you know we weren't like it wasn't like economics is a prestige you know there's massively endowed business schools and so on we can see a future where maybe whatever whatever the path they're in this new science of culture is going to be pretty major and central to our kind of intellectual field that's kind of a, a kind of thesis that i i think we're exploring here could you say yeah. what you think the directions that would go in like over the next 10 or 20 years, or that you might be like, you would like to see it go in or, but what do you think are the trends here and what are the gaps? Well, I mean, the, the thing that we've been encountering, uh, which, so I don't know if what you're saying is, I would like to see what you're saying be correct, but I'm not sure it's going to be correct. Cause I mean, universities are so ossified. So it's hard to imagine a university ever saying I'm, we're creating a department of cultural evolution. Um, I mean, just to give you a sense, so at Harvard, like many places, the the quote sciences are in one under one dean and in one administrative unit, and then other things are in other administrative units. But the field of cultural evolution takes seriously genetic evolution, thinks of humans as a kind of animal, studies epigenetics and how that might affect cultural preferences, and at the same time is interested in you know where do ethnic groups come from, uh, how does social stratification emerge, what leads to innovation. Uh, all things that you would find in economics and sociology and other kinds of fields like that, also religion. So I'm interested in the origins and evolution of religion or religions, um, none of which would normally be on with the biologists and the physicists, right? So the organization of the university makes it hard to have a, a department of cultural evolution. Now, you could always have centers and stuff, and there are centers. Um, it, the, at Arizona State University, they have the Department of Human Evolution and Social Change, which is actually a kind of experiment, I guess, where they have the anthropologists together with lots of other disciplines. Um, so that's a case. My department, uh, Human Evolutionary Biology, we sit with the physicists and the biologists, but we do have people who stretch across into these other disciplines like economics. Now, one of the, so I'm actually going to a meeting of, um, leading scholars from different disciplines in in uh november and basically our charge is that we've given ourselves is to design a proper in, interdisciplinary social science so for example a simple question to ask yourself is what how would you train a graduate student 
you know, and so I, you know, I want them to, to know how to do ethnography. Like, I think one of the problems of development economics is that you got to go there and live among the population to really understand what's going on. But, you, you, you know, it's also good to have an instrumental variable or to conduct randomized field trials or all the kind of things we see in, in modern economics. So we, I want all those tools to be available and, you know, at the ready for, for a young student. So just to go back in terms of things, so I know you, I know you keep, I, I'm going to keep the term cultural evolution, sorry, to, or culturology, a science of the study of culture in its real breadth of these interdisciplinary things, or the cultural evolution, the science of sort. And one thing you've just mentioned about the future and why what gets in the way, uh, particularly maybe of this term culture, is that it's it's interdisciplinarity and particularly it's not interdisciplinarity in the sciences. It's not like biologists and physicists need to hang out which is already a challenge it's that biologists and you know um need to hang out with anthropologists and the so the, there's this kind of structural you know, a general ossification problem um you know and i really know i mean I, i'm no longer in academia but i still collaborate and so on so i know that so that's one kind of institutional or cultural thing but let's say things went well what are kind of the topics you'd like to see studied or like what are the kind of gaps or the really interesting you know where are you know where, you know for me um to give a concrete example we it seems that you have examples your book and maybe you could now give some where we can study okay a particular feature you know let, let me give you, you know might be that way people are going to pr prepare manioc for eating or they're going to um you know uh, avoid pellagra by preparing cornmeal in a certain way you can mention these from your book those are very specific but then what we could call is like mean plexes in in another area like maybe marriage and family the the marriage and family program for your weirdest people is an example or even like puritanism or when we sometimes we say the western world so there are these much bigger levels kind of like whole constellations of values views beliefs practices um and you know from a really another area that i come from like people are you know, like people have these kind of I don't know, grand unified theories, which are not in, they're in fashion physics, but not in social sciences. You know, there are like, may, you know, major waves of human kind of cultural development, you know. Um, so I don't know if you've heard like teal organizations or, you know, have you heard this term teal organization? No, tell, tell me. So, well, I, I, I should come into Well, maybe I said so people, um, the term there's a guy called Ken Wilbur and spiral dynamics. I don't know. This is a whole different topic, um, which was kind of interested in hu human development in a broad sense. Um, and this is like people in in Harvard and other places. You also got interested in like lifespan development. You know how do humans evolve over the lifespan, not just developmental mm -hmm. psychology. And particularly, mm -hmm. there was all this stuff that kind of there's small population of people who kind of did some quite radical stuff. You know, this Robert Keegan, who you might have heard of right mm -hmm. which is people can kind of become self-transcendent or maslow you know self-transcendence not just self-actualizing um we don't have we have data we do have data on this stuff then what came up was that there was this argument that people's kind of values could evolve in substantive ways like you know we start out focused on me that's both as a tiny child, but there's an analogy with cultures. Cultures are focused on, you know, the big man or something like that. This is very crude simplification now of anthropological evolutionary history. But there's clearly points like we, for example, we expand our domain of concern from me to my tribe to larger groups and ultimately to the world and then to all beings, for example. And these kind of this kind of background have these grand theories of like there are these kind of cultural stages of humanity. Um, and why this has then showed up and been very influential is maybe more in the management consulting and this discussion of teal organizations and this particular word teal, these people who came up with these grand unified theory ended up using colors. So there's like red societies, red is like the mafia and like, it's all about the strong, you know, man or woman. And there's this color spectrum. So modernity in this spectrum is orange. It's all about rationality. It's all about reason. It's all about meritocracy. It's about um, bureaucracy. And then the next stage has been kind of more like egalitarian, postmodernism. It's, you know, they have this grand unified you know, theory that these standard kind of things that highly correlate. You know, in a principal components analysis, it'd be like there's these different dimensions of values or views that highly mm. correlate to reduce to a smaller dimensional draft. 
And the okay. teal phrase is the next one. And so there is a highly influential book called Reinventing Organizations, influential in Silicon Valley and other places about like, we need organizations that are much flatter, but where people have a lot more autonomy, but they also are responsible, where they can kind of coordinate in different ways. Um, and for me, by the way, reading your work, one of the connections was what was this revolution of Puritanism, uh, of, of the Reformation? This did, um, maybe in this case through a religion or some set of views and values, shape how people could coordinate, organize in a radically uh, different way, a much more maybe egalitarian way, a much more effective way because people could self kind of police in their heads a bit. They, you know, God's watching them and so on, all these classic stories about it. Mm -hmm. So to kind of come back, so the question I was asking you is these these are kind of discussions. Where are we in the science of this from? We have now examples and maybe you could describe where we can trace a given practice and it's maybe phylogeny or its development um, or at least demonstrate, you know, certain practices are culturally transmitted. But these kind of and, and then you have an example in your book of the marriage of family programs and quite big one and how that influenced. But where are we in like, you know, one day are we going to be able to say, wow, you know, we can explain the how this, you know, this new whole culture evolved, you know, or there's a pocket, you know, there's a new pocket of something really new emerging over here in, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the southwest United States where, you know, it's got these different features that have never been seen before together of a cultural yeah. behavior. Yeah. So, I mean. You know, the, the field, because it focuses on individual learners, at least at the core, it's it's going to – some an approach like that would be, say, you know, say you're broadly interested in democracy. And you would look at, well, what kinds of cultural beliefs in a population tend to foster the spread of democratic norms, democratic practices? And you could study things like, you know, do school committees vote or, you know, how do families operate? Do, do people, do, do kids have a vote at the dinner table or where they're going to go the next day or something like that? And, uh, but then once you begin to get practices like that, the question will be, how do those beliefs and practices, institutions, what kinds of things do they attract? Do they make certain other ideas more likely? So, for example, one idea that I've toyed with, and it's hard to get good data on it, but the idea of the spread of monogamous marriage may have actually created uh, a milieu that made de democracy more likely to spread. And historians have suggested this as well. So that's two unrelated things that you might not normally put together. But because of the way that uh, enforced monogamy alters the marriage pattern for elite men, that might you know, create more equity with, within families and give fem women more bargaining power in the household. And that may encourage more democracy, right? That, that's just one kind of hypothesis. But in any case, um, so we'll be able to say, well, I mean, the, the hope is that we'll be able to say how different practices and beliefs affect each other, thinking about a population of either acquiring or not acquiring these kinds of beliefs. Some ideas we're gonna learn fit better with uh, aspects of human nature. So they're more readily to get picked up. Maybe there are ideas and practices that are don't fit as well with human nature, but are really good for getting people to cooperate. And you need to have a lot of socialization practices, rituals, other kinds of institutions that help get these kind of hard to think practices and ideas into people's heads. So it'll be a kind of a complex articulation of psychology, cultural and, and sort of innate psychology, um, with all the bits and pieces that form a society, and then thinking about how those bits and pieces fit together. The, the stuff you were describing with the stages makes me really nervous because uh, that, that that's not the picture that's emerging. That's those are those are made up stages thinking. Right, exactly. It's ri it's much richer than that. I think. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think. I think. Uh, I think there are. Um, what I guess I would want to ask, which kind of came out of that though, for myself. Um, was when I was asking about the future of the field, what idea, one question I guess I would have is there are things like the World Value Survey or the European Value Survey, but would we start to get, if we had better data, you know, can I kind of sit, I sat there more informally and be like, okay, if I, if one had quite detailed stuff and you might get it now out of Facebook or things, can you see new norms kind of almost emerging in real time? Or you know, just as like in genetics, we might be able to say, okay, um, we haven't seen this this um, this this gene happen. Well, this is a new mo mutation. This is a new thing, and we're going to see how it interacts. If one was interested in, like, okay, um, 
you know, I don't know, this even today there might be easier things to track, but like the spread of, I don't know, sustainability attitudes or the spread of concern for nature. That I just was kind of asking the next 20 years of the field, is this aspect that we might be able to have more granular kind of cross-cultural, yeah. you know? Well, that's that's definitely the way things are going. I mean, you know, there's a proliferation of data data sets like the World Value Survey, but the real frontier is, uh, well, I think it's using... It's getting data from social media and uh, online sources, and then figuring out how to analyze it using natural language processing. So what my lab's working on is try to measure aspects of psychology. So things like analytic thinking or uh, tightness and looseness, inclinations towards individualism, impersonal cooperation, uh, and trying to pry that out of text. So for example, we have the corpus of US newspapers going back to well, at least 1840. And, you know, we're analyzing that to study psychological variation across space and time. And, you know, we can also do that in the modern world. So for example, I'm interested in witchcraft and there's a symbol uh, that appears on Twitter, which is an evil eye protection symbol, uh, the Nassar. And so we're analyzing the appearance and diffusion and increasing frequency of the use of that symbol. Right. And because there's there's two parts here, because for me, I was seeing they're saying, hey, um, forgetting even necessarily the, the stages question of what the grant, the question would be what these kind of mean plexes that there are, like which comes up, let's say in more classic stuff, Inglehart and the World Value Survey, like, you know, there's, we're going to have this crude, to, good, but useful two dimension, you know, there's more, I don't know, autonomy or self-expression or the Shalom Swartz and this kind of seven, you know, these seven factors. But could we get a lot more granular and see now that's sort of a principle components analysis out of like a 50 questionnaire survey. Could we start to kind of see that and see particularly interesting pockets of innovation happening? And then the second point you're saying uh, is the what's causing that or how they they function. Um, you know, let, let me. Um, yeah. How, how, what's the cause of factors and, and what causes something to seed or spread? I think that was going back to your first point of. There's also these interesting connections between some maybe cultural feature, kind of not it wasn't the intention of it, but the accidental benefit in some other way, like monogamy, monogamy practices leading to actually growing inequality, uh, growing equality, and therefore maybe leading to actually more democracy, which leads to more economic effectiveness or something like that. Right. Um, you know, to take another example from a book I read recently, you know, people like oh, Burning Man, which you probably have heard of, but you know, this is a this is a nascent mi microculture. There are values and norms that you're evolving there, which are kind of the frontier of something that, you know, it's highly creative. It's, you know, I, I'm not saying I subscribe to that, but it would be the example where you might say, okay, is it the case? How right. could I work out whether it's really the case that people going, uh, you know, Burning Man has a distinct set of values from the rest of the, the population. Right. And how is that spreading? How, how do those people, when they go there, they go back to their work. Does that transmit? How, how does it, you know? Yeah. What, yeah. What, I mean, it would be interesting to think about how you could do that with Burning Man, but we, I mean, we're getting an increasing ability to do that. I mean, something, a simple example that that reminds me of is that, you know, there's this paper in economics, I forget the authors, where um, there ends up being a situation where people get uh, randomly picked to go to the Hajj. And they go to the Hajj and they they experience, they, they experience that and they actually become more cosmopolitan and more tuned into the to global values as, as a consequence of that experience. And it's a random assignment situation. So you can infer causality. So that's a case where we know there's a ritual that has a certain psychological effect. You can imagine something similar with Burning Man. And then people go back to somewhere and then do, do those ideas spread? Do they have legs in these different kinds of communities? And then you can try to explain why they might have legs in some communities, but not others. Exactly. Why, why do they take off? And, and perhaps also what both there's the kind of context, but also what's the practice? I mean, an, um, another example, you know, for me would always be like, uh, you know, a friend of mine, we, you know, you go to a meditation retreat, it would be an amazing experience. Like this is really important. You know, a friend of mine, we used to joke and we'd like, what's the half-life? You know, you go back to London or wherever or Boston and, you know, and you, you, you're back in your normal life. You're like, oh, it was so important to practice every day. You know, it made me so feel, and then you don't. And obviously this huge impact of what's called sangha or community are there other people practicing with you and how um and particularly for pro-social practices that could be 
that could be a very important question. So both yeah. what's the context, but what other things like, you know, if people stay in touch, how does that affect that? Right, right. Um, so maybe to talk about that, what, what things have we already found? For, just maybe if you summarize a bit from us, you give some examples where we have been looking at this kind of evil, both development and evolution. The, there are some examples of your book, but maybe you'd all the weirdest people in the world and where the kind of frontier of that is concretely things that like you, you would look, you'd want to look at maybe start with examples of what you have found. Um, if you were. Yeah. So, um, I mean, my late, my obsession lately has been trying to understand innovation. And, uh, so for example, we're working on stuff. Now we have a global patent database, which gives us a measure of innovation, at least as captured by patents. So we focus narrowly on Europe, and then we say, why do some regions of countries have more patents than other parts of countries? Uh, and I want to test the ideas developed in the weirdest people in the world. So what we look at is different parts of Germany, say, were spent more centuries under the medieval church. And so we're able to connect that to differences in the social structure in terms of the families. And we get that from a different survey. And, and then we can look at how far people's friendships are based on Facebook data. So that gives us another social measure. And then we can look at aspects of psychology from the European Social Survey, which asks people about trust and fairness and conformity and these kinds of questions. And what we find is that the church affects that. And then those things seem to cash out on more patents. So in places where the church was longer, people are more individualistic, less conformity, more trusting. They have friends that are further away uh, and they have smaller families and they produce more patents. And, you know, we can compare regions within the same country and, and hold lots of stuff constant. So, and, and so for listeners, let's just walk this through going back. Why maybe to start with the medieval church, and it's obviously central to your book, The Widest People of the World, which I just cannot recommend to listeners enough to read. Fa really uh, fascinating of like the rise of the West in a way, like really interesting answer. But to start with, the, why is the medieval church important here? What's the impact of that? You said on individualism and family structure. J just walk that through briefly, and then we'll I get that, that that's going to kind of turn out into psychology and then into patenting. But let's start yeah. with that. Yeah, so uh, the the branch of Christianity that eventually leads to the Roman Catholic Church uh, began to adopt a set of unusual practices in a global historical perspective. So they, for example, banned cousin marriage, first to first cousins, but then it eventually goes out to six cousins around 1000 CE and contracts back just down to third cousins in, in 1215. Um, they end polygyny. So the, the Franks and the Celts and stuff were all polygynous. So they, you know, they end that. Uh, and concubinage, um, new inheritance practices, rather than patrilineal inheritance, which was common throughout Europe, they have bilateral inheritance. So you inherit both your identity through, through uh, mom and dad. And so that begins spreading throughout Europe. And what that effectively does is it begins to dismantle the clans of Europe and breaks them down into monogamous nuclear families. And of course, this church spreads kind of, you know, semi-randomly out from Rome and, you know, it goes to England early, but then very late to Scotland and Wales and places like that. So there's this interest, these interesting patterns of variation. And so I think that had a big effect on uh, how cultural evolution went in those places and the development of, imp of other kinds of institutions. So when you break the family down, the complex kinship structures of lots of societies, they're not only your personal identity, they're the groups that do production and, and, and distribution, they're also the groups that are your legal identity uh, in dealing with laws. And when you break people down to nuclear families, you get rid of all that. And also a lot of the security that goes along with that, who takes care of you if you're injured or old, that used to be your kin network. And now it's got to be done by something else. So these new institutions around 1000 CE begin emerging in Europe. So you think about guilds, which eventually become occupational guilds, monasteries begin proliferating, universities pop up. Um, and charter towns. So these people would join the towns as citizens, participate in the defense and whatnot. They'd often get some privileges and whatnot. And so these charter towns with certain rights to the individual begin diffusing to Europe. So new kinds of institutions you wouldn't have seen otherwise. So like when I was talking about democracy before, this is a case where the church did a bunch of things because they thought that, you know, God wanted them to do that, just like 
in, in Islam, you can only have four wives and in Zoroastrianism, you should marry relatives, right? So religions have different family policies, but that had these downstream implications for the kinds of other institutions that were likely yes. to emerge. And that then affects people's psychology and downstream economic productivity, success and competition against other groups. So to summarize, the church had these unusual policies about family, uh, you know, marriage and family that break down traditional kinship networks and clans. That leads to kind of more individualism. But the consequence is, we, we, you know, humans don't function well on our own. We need to collaborate with others. So instead of the family relationships, we start building more kind of like ties outwards. Um, right. And that leads to more egalitarianism and individualism to these charter towns and so and so on and so forth. And to finish that with then the example is that um, th this kind of the the you have this kind of variable of how long different places in Europe were exposed to these the kind of the the, the Catholic Church's policies that were, kind of cashes out in kind of family structure, which cashes out in kind of psychology and behaviors and, and friendship networks. And that then shows up in, for example, innovation levels. Right. Now, one thing that's kind of like negative and positive about this story, I just want to flag again to our policy implication story is, um, you know, like the hard thing about hard things, like this took thousands, hundreds or thousands of years, and then has payoffs for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, you know, what we, you know, because often like I just say, you know, I've advised, I was a kind of, policy and innovation, you know, uh, economists. And so talk to government, they're always like, you know, what, you know, can't we, you know, have, I don't know, a, a startup fund or something. And what we're kind of saying of them in this is the, actually some of the really big things go really deep and aren't easy to kind of, you know, you can't just say, we're going to set up a new kind of innovation office and that's going to lead to more innovation, really. That's one big actual implication of some of this work. But the other way about it, what I hear is that a long-term attitude that, supports um cultural change oh sorry can have really 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 big impacts for a really long time yeah yeah and i mean so one way to, to so look at that story you could look at the well it doesn't give us much to do in terms of policy because we can't we can't affect how long the catholic church has been around but it does tell you well what do i need to get innovation well i need free trusting and cooperative interactions among cognitively diverse minds how do i get that well, it so happens the, U the U.S. bumbled onto that um, by having lots of immigration during the 19th century. And one of the other projects is, is we look at uh, what leads to innovation in different U.S. counties. And we find uh, counties that have more diverse last names, meaning people from more different kinds of backgrounds, more different families, uh, leads to more innovation in, coming, in the coming decade. So you can think about this as a kind of measure of cultural diversity measured at the family level. And then we're predicting into the future, how many patents are you going to get? And then, you know, so the economists will worry, well, we're not sure that's causal. So what we use are these immigration shocks. So there are these tools from economics that allow you to predict whether a county is going to get an immigration shock. And that gives us an infusion of last names leading to more cognitive diversity and more innovation. Uh, and so anyway, there's this cool relationship between more uh, immigration and more innovation. Um, and something like, you know, Petra's Moser, Moser's work, where she looks at the immigration quotas that were imposed in the U.S. in 1924, you know, that that causes immigration to plummet. Prohibition causes immigration to plummet. Now, prohibition is a great case because you might think, well, alcohol, people are not drinking, maybe they should be have better cognitive processes. But turns out ideas meet in saloons and, uh, you know, they make baby ideas there. So uh, anyway, so, but it, so it gives you a bunch of tools, you know, what are we going to do to create the f trusting interaction among diverse minds? Right. And the, um, the other aspect that we're kind of having here is also some insight that allows us to create conditions for this. I mean, what I think what we kind of have is that um, maybe one thing for your book is that if, one of the learnings from this cultural thing is that a lot that, that individually we're actually quite dumb. What we have is the benefit of this huge cumulative learning that is our culture. Um, yeah, and and that's that's uh, that's a theme that runs through both the secret of our success, the weirdest people in the world, and it's really the core of the new book I'm working on, 
is that uh, individuals, especially if you strip us of all our cultural knowledge, we're really not good at solving problems. We really, when we depend on this big download of tools for thinking and problem solving and framing things, and you had mentioned ontology, or like what even exists in the world? What are the things I could, you know, do germs exist? Does witchcraft exist? What, what am I working with here? Uh, and then, of course, our ability to generate new ideas is mostly the recombination of existing ideas that are all circulating in the cultural milieu. And it's the bringing together of those different ideas that really drive a lot. Um, so you got you got to nurture the collective brain. Um, geniuses and whatnot are much less important than in the popular myth, the myth of the heroic inventor, for example. Right. And the point I'm also getting at there is that just as at one point, um, well, so basically now we have more knowledge about culture and cultural evolution, while it might take a long time, we can now, in a way, we can benefit from that learning and transport stuff. I mean, what, one example in your book was that I, that I took also in the weirdest people in the world is that this, this kind of, um, and it might seem negative, but this kind of destruction of traditional kinship networks, which in the long run has this benefit, well, China starts doing in 1950. It's 1950 that I think they ban concubinage. Um, which is polygony, they they ban they start banning partly an imitation of of, of the kind of West, but com the Communist Party did a load of stuff. And the other example, which I'm very close to, because my partner is is Taiwanese, um, you know, you know, you could say the Confucian, the basic Confucian cultural download is quite hierarchical. You know, classically, if you look at Shalom Swartz, China would show up on you know quite hierarchical in the model and quite, um, but yet you know Taiwan within a period of fifty years has become quite a well-functioning democracy like there seems to be like this is the point you can culture is sticky normally for reasons just because they create institutions which are equilibria point and you know there's a whole bunch of reasons we can go into why it's often hard to change culture but when it does because of the way imitation works it can happen very quickly so i think right. the other point is that but if we realize that it's culture that we need to shift sometimes that rather than like you know we're not going to build a fancy new like you know technology office at it might be like we need to enable more people to meet in the cafeteria or we need to have a new attitude to risk taking or something like that. Those things can actually move quite quickly, but it's that we do need to be conscious. It's that, you know, if we go and just imitate Finnish, the layout of Finnish schools, nothing much will happen. But if we imitated the attitude of Finnish teachers or something like that, then might, then we might have a lot of impact. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a great point is that uh, culture is often sticky and inertial because you have different institutions that sort of interlock and it makes it hard for even if you have the new Burning Man idea about egalitarianism or something, it doesn't fit with all the other practices and stuff in the society. So it's hard for it to get moving. But if you reorganize things so that it, 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 there's not disincentives to adopting or spreading that idea, then things can change quickly, like the Taiwan case. Uh, I mean, there's lots of cases like that. Yes, there are. I mean, um, I mean, it, you've mentioned the obvious one is it while well, obviously it built on the marriage and family program um the spread of literacy with protestantism as as a very often a very rapid change in the level of of of, of reading or something like that right. um yeah okay so just to go um back are there other examples so the marriage and family program knowing research stuff you probably that took a lot of thought and there there are other examples that are fascinating in your book uh like i think i'm pronouncing the ilahita uh, or am I getting the tribe? Why yeah. I want to mention these is in our day and age today, um, scaling, like we have the challenges that we face, most dramatically the ecological crisis we face are collective action problems. Um, and you could see one massive aspect of, um, I don't know, um, what you call social institutions, but also culture as having been ways often because of intergroup competition to, to scale cooperation in some way. I mean, that's right. And could you talk a little bit about maybe the example there or other examples you've come across where groups have scaled? And because I mentioned in the context today, we kind of somehow need to scope scale a bit globally. We somehow need to have enough identification or connection that we can act on these wicked problems that we face. And obviously societies have done that you know, and the Ilahita had a wicked problem of a neighbor that was going to kind of take them over. Can you, maybe with that example, others, could you talk that through a bit for the audience of like? Those yeah, examples? I mean, the Ilahita case is uh, interesting because it, it's a it's a small scale society of the Arapesh in New Guinea. 
And uh, anthropologists who had been studying this region thought there was a kind of ecological threshold. Ecolo ecology was forcing people not to have communities more than about 300 people or 70 men. So they thought that society groups were bumping up against this. But then they found this exceptional village of, you know, depending on how you count, 1,500 or 2,500 people were living in Ilahita, and it was most powerful community in the area. It was very safe from its neighbors because it, they had such a large fighting force compared to the other groups. And I mean, what they had, what had happened there was they had the same system as everybody else, but there was this aggressively expanding group nearby that seemed to have a ritual cult of some kind. And when they copied the cult, they made certain mistakes in which they ended up with communal wide gods and a communal wide set of rituals that kind of build bridges between the different clans. And it turns out when these communities split, they split along clan lines. So this structure builds connections between the clans and helps keep everybody kind of working more harmoniously. And if things start to go bad in the village, people thought that the gods were not happy with them. So they would begin doing the rituals anymore. And the rituals are a kind of social technology which bonds people together. And that would, you know, re-nurture the, the bridges between clans and between individuals uh, and help keep the group together. But this was one of these, uh, I use it as a case of institutional evolution because so much of our institutional evolution is not conscious design. Yes. I mean, just to give you one example, the, you know, people point to the founding fathers of the U.S. And of course, a lot of thought went into the Constitution, but they never imagined political parties or they were against political parties, I should say, didn't want them to be part of the system. But of course, political parties immediately invaded and have, and have been central to the system. So the system was never designed to have political parties. I mean, that's just an example of an unforeseen consequence. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so, so that's the main point. A lot of my interest has been in how religious ideas uh, foster cooperation and get spread by this intergroup competition process. Well, of course, just to be clear, religion, again, an area which is often taboo, like we'll come to the potential dead ends of modernity. The, the, going, if I'm an economist, collective, a lot of stuff is collective action problems. Let's call it in the most generic for, like version or private information. Like if you really got economic technical about it, like you're going to do something that I don't, and I don't know whether you've done it or not. I don't know how you'll, you know, you're going to do my gardening. I don't know how hard you're going to work, you know, um, or you're, you know, we're going to go fight against the enemy and i don't know if you're going to shirk or not or like you know all kinds of stuff like that and basically we need some methods of binding cohesion but also creating kind of internal monitoring or so, so basically ways that you won't shirk in some way right, right. um uh in, i'm kind of doing this in a nutshell i'm doing uh, probably violence just for readers who are technical to some of it and religion obviously plays this central uh, role in doing a whole bunch of things, but obviously in creating kind of cohesion, but also dealing with 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 kind of shirking and other types of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to get punished by the gods. You're going to, you you know, you, you have examples of that about taboos in your, your book. I mean, there's many examples, but, and this is again in the Ilahita case, just to flag it, this tribe that grew basically, let's put it this way, they, they grew to three or four times the scale that was thought feasible for a group in that area. And but could you talk about like religion was central there in what kind of ways, just in that one example? Yeah. So, I mean, the big thing they had there was they had um, these rituals that would um, uh, give men basically the ability to uh, uh, allow men to pass through these age sets. And the way that it was organized was such that it would uh, create interdependence among men from different clans. So it would kind of pull them together and give them a sense of psychology of inter interdependence. We know from work in psychology and related fields that actually performing a ritual together can increase the amount of binding between you. They also began to believe that these gods that were over the entire community, rather than just the usual clan gods, would um, punish people. And they could use that as an explanation for what would otherwise be witchcraft accusations. And oftentimes clans would split apart and get angry with each other because if someone died, they would think someone from another clan bewitched them. But now there was an, an explanation could be given that it was it was the action of the village gods, uh, this this cult that they had. And anyway, so, so there are a bunch of little factors that work together there to, to bind people together. I mean, one of the other things about religion, besides having, you know, punishing gods and shared notions of reality and shared um, 
you know, aspects of morality, it also has these rituals, which either bind individuals together or they bind people to their beliefs. They make people, you know, believe yeah. more strongly in, in, in the commitments. Now for today, we're going to come, uh, we're coming near the end. So I want to kind of just lead this because what uh, we've only just really just started this discussion, because if we were thinking in a way, and you do talk about it in your book, we could think of uh, an evolutionary tree of culture and practices that allow uh, for well, in one sense, they could allow for scaling. There's competition between groups. Um, just and, and we can think of this as an analogy with genetics, but there's competition with groups, and that's going to pressure like development along uh, of like, can you get bigger as a society to some extent? That because that's a crude way of defending yourself, at least at the beginning, until mm -hmm. you have nuclear weapons or something. Um, uh, so one of the points I think you make in the Widdish people is that what was very unusual about what happened in the West um was because the marriage of family, like most other societies it's kind of gone a kinship route and then scaling has happened basically via empire some kinship knit elite ends up basically controlling a large number of the people because right. they're right. A, they have exploitative technologies or slavery or whatever but what was really unusual about the west in the long run was that we didn't go that route yet managed to scale um right. and the point was if i put it this way just as like um, there are certain evolutionary dead ends in genetics. We can think of things which are highly adaptive, but at some point, the problem about them is they're sort of a dead end. You can't, there's no way to kind of go forward from there. You know, there are local, local maxima, if you like, or whatever. Right. Similarly, kinship, like really developing your kinship structure can be highly effective. But to go back to our point about uh, like institutional equilibria, if you're really, really locked into that, it's very hard to change. That's Right. Right. And yep. why it comes back to this, and this is kind of ending point, maybe you've got some comments, but we could imagine if we did do another episode, is where are we going today? So let me take a concrete example, which is um, to go back to religion. The West, I'm just going to be a provocative here. The West went down a route, which famously in Weber's phrase, once we let the genie out of the bottle with Protestant, they didn't realize it. But once you have enough free thinking, you're going to kind of come to science. Then you come to materialist reductionism. And then the magic is Weber's, Weber's phrase, the magic has gone out of the world. Um, there, everyone predicted the late 19th century, all the intellectuals, there's going to be a problem coming because basically, ultimately, it's going to destroy religion. And religion is what you've described, a major thing that binds us. Now, maybe you could say that science in a certain way is religion or there are certain other faiths, but they're very thin faiths in a way compared to the other faiths. So one example, just being provocative, is are we in something of a dead end? at the moment where individualism, which has been fantastic and hugely valuable in lots of ways, I'm at least gonna say, um, but there are limits like high, you know, when they have lots of externalities, there are problems in individualism. And similarly, scientific materialism, which has been hugely productive in many ways, taken to where it is, paints us in to a dead end. It takes us away from the magic of the world. So I'm just asking this question, maybe we could talk to that particular point, but in a more general question that if we were to have a follow-up, if we were starting to paint this like evolutionary tree, for example, of organizational structures that allow us to scale and solve collective action problems, and we have bad need of that today, where are we? Where are, to go back to my question, even of studying little groups, you know, with Facebook data of where new stuff is popping up, where is the equivalent of like, you know, Martin Luther or even the Catholic Church in 50 AD? Where are these, you know, what are our dead ends we feel today? And sometimes our dead ends are actually the most evolved thing because they've exhausted themselves. Where are the other places on our cultural evolutionary tree that are most exciting? Um, maybe we can't even predict. We don't have that capacity yet, but we at least have the ability to notice when mm -hmm. they are happening. Right. Do you think that, yeah, any comments on that? And I said, it's maybe at this point, we're at the end of the episode. This is something we might come to if we had a follow-up, but any just immediate thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to re-describe what you were saying, because I think it's a really important point, which is that um, in the weirdest people in the world, I make the case that most societies got complex and larger by building on the notion of uh, kin kinship intensity or these complex kinship units where eventually you have an elite which is you know emperors and the lineage and they're stratified so they don't there's all these other uh, farmers and whatnot that form the lower half and what happened because of the uh, not intentionally but unintentionally due to the church's marriage and family program Europe gets knocked down and, you know, dark ages or whatever. And then um, it, when it rebuilds itself, it's going up a different, a different peak, a, a peak that can go higher, at least in terms of economic production. 
The first one is in some sense easier to access because you know we are primates and we have a kin psychology and we have a bunch of elements of human nature which make that one easy to hit. The church puts those away by making taboos against them and that forces it up this other peak. The chances that that's the best of all possible peaks is quite low, right? Just as a statistical matter, the second peak we found. Um, so, so I mean, I just, just in kinds of thinking about a broad cultural evolutionary canvas, there must be other uh, recombinations of cultural institutions and ways of thinking that uh, can lead to even greater prosperity or greater happiness or all the kind of good things, greater human flourishing. Um, now, where and what that's going to look like is harder to imagine, because I always say that cultural evolution is smarter than we are. Uh, but the place to look would be novel recombinations, right? So we can see some of these around. Uh, I mean, in what's going on in China, it's a recombination of Western capitalism and some other Western institutions, universities, plus a lot of um, older Chinese statecraft and Chinese institutions. So that's a new recombination. Japan has a new recombination. We're going to see new recombinations appear in Africa and the Middle East. And so I, we, we don't know whether those are going to be great pathways or whether they're going to lead to more human flourishing, but there, there are experiments that are in process uh, all around the globe. Wow, I think that's a great point to end on. So thank you very, very much. And uh, listeners, I hope we'll, we tune, we'll tune in if we have a follow-up. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Henrich. Okay, great to be with you. Thanks.